What are some practical ways to organize people interested in reinforcing Western values and culture without attracting extremists? Well, th that's a good question. Um, reading group might not be a bad idea. You know, there's lots of ways of pick a classic of the Western canon, pick Dante's Inferno or Paradise Lost, something difficult, or maybe not, or try to try something that's more straightforward. I mean, Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil is a difficult book, but it's easier than those, the two I just mentioned. Start a discussion group. Um, start a book group. That's, that's a possibility. Um, live out your values properly and see how that works. Uh, you know, if you're organizing a, if, if you have your own organization, your own business, your own family, for that matter, you try to organize it along the principles that you describe, try to organize it for truth and, and along, try to organize it so that it's predicated on truth and courage and responsibility and the reduction of unnecessary suffering and the elimination of malevolence. Like seriously do that and see what happens to your organization. I mean, I've seen people now go into large-scale organizations that were collapsing quite badly under the weight of accumulated sins of omission, let's say. So uh, lies of failure to attend and to listen to everyone in the organization. These are large-scale organizations. To listen to everyone in the organization to say, look, I'm here to find out what the problems are. You can actually tell me like a real high alpha male, like, you know, uh, real empathy. You can tell me what the problems are. I want to know what the problems are. And I don't want any, I don't want it, it sugarcoated. And the reason I don't want it sugarcoated is because I want to know what the problems are. And the reason that I want to know is because I think that if we faced them, we could fix them and that that would be better for everyone. And then to start to gather information about what it is in the institution that's corrupt and functioning improperly and to start to set it right, and that works. And like the evidence for this, I think, is solid that it works. There's good evidence that, um, there's a good book, for example, called The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, written by a Harvard emeritus professor whose name escapes me momentarily, but he talked about the unbelievably high economic value of interpersonal trust, which I think is the most fundamental natural resource. Um, and we know too that one of the best predictors of long-term success in complex organizations isn't agreeableness or compassion, which is the only virtue that seems to matter at the moment, even though its status as a virtue is highly debatable in my estimation, because compassion has to be temp tempered with judgment, otherwise it's devouring. Um, but conscientiousness is an excellent predictor of long-term success for individuals and conscientious people are truthful and reliable and industrious and orderly. You know, that can be a problem because it, it can lead to a, a kind of rigidity. So it's not the only virtue that's necessary, but it does seem to be the case that honesty is a productive policy. And I would also say that if you look around the world, the cultures that are the most corrupt are the cultures that are the most poor. And you could say, well, the reason that they're corrupt is because they're poor. But I don't believe that because then you'd have to also agree that if you're poor, you're corrupt. And I don't think that's true. I think the corruption drives the poverty. Now, there's no doubt somewhat of a feedback loop there. But um, you get rid of corruption, you get rid of poverty. That's my sense. And, and like, like I said, you can make the opposite argument if you want. Well, poverty causes corruption. Well, really, so, so your claim is that the poor are more corrupt because they're poor. That's your fundamental claim and that the poverty is driving the corruption. And I'm afraid I don't believe that. I don't think that the poor, there may be more corrupt people who are poor, but that's because they're corrupt. If you take poor people as a group, people who are relatively deprived materially, I don't believe that there's any evidence that they are more corrupt than people who are uh, more materially, what would you call, satiated. 
So um, practical ways to organize people interested in reinforcing Western values and cultures. I don't think you have to attract extremists. I think that if you reinforce Western values and culture, you, you, you turn away the extremists. I mean, what sort of extremist is going to believe in personal responsibility and, and, and individual culpability? Those aren't extremist ideas. They're, they're anti-extremist ideas. You can't group together around the notion of ultimate personal responsibility. So I think to the degree that you are reinforcing genuine Western values and culture, you, you eliminate the extremists. Look, you can look at the historical record. You know, if I remember correctly, and I believe this to be the case, no two democracies have yet gone to war. No two modern democracies have yet gone to war with one another. You know, and the relationship between modern democracy and high standard of living, high quality of opportunity, and and genuine improvements across the decades, I would say, is extraordinarily high. And so I would say intrinsically, if you're promoting Western values, the most fundamental values, especially the doctrine of the sanctity of the individual and the associated responsibilities that go along with that, that that just drives the extremists away. That's my sense of it.